Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, John Twetness. John Twetness is the Associate Director of Research at BYU Institute for the Study and Preservation of Ancient Religious Texts. He earned a BA in Anthropology, a Graduate Certificate in Middle East Area Studies, an MA in Linguistics, and an MA in Hebrew at the University of Utah, and did postgraduate work at the University of California, Berkeley, and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He taught for 17 years at the University of Utah and the Salt Lake and Jerusalem centers of BYU. He has published eight books and more, more than 200 articles and is an associate editor, editor of the Ancient Texts and Mormon Studies series. While many of his writings have appeared in books, magazines, and journals for the LDS audience, some of his works have been published by the University of Utah, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, the Pontifical Biblical Institute, and the Journal of Near Eastern Studies. He is a convert to the church and has served in numerous positions, including a full-time mission in France and Switzerland, as well as stake and district missions in Utah and Israel. Let's give a warm welcome to John Twetness. I was mostly right. Uh, I, well, if I, gave, if I gave you that, I gave it to you before we had all the title changes. Uh, nobody has the same titles they had before. And they now call me the, uh, a senior resident scholar. I'm taking my shoes off because I have peripheral neuropathy and it's a lot more comfortable for my feet without uh, those shoes on. Um, the other thing is I'm, no longer, I'm not the associate editor of the Ancient Texts and Mormon Studies series. I'm now the editor. Uh, because uh, we've had a lot of shifting around lately. Um, I want to correct, first of all, something that, was, uh, that may have been a misimpression for you last night when uh, mention was made of farms, which is now officially called the Institute for the Study and Preservation of Ancient Religious Texts. We have not given up on the Book of Mormon. <laughs> we still publish lots of things on the Book of Mormon. We do the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, which comes out twice annually. And uh, the last, oh, out of the last half dozen books, four of them, were on uh, Book of Mormon uh, studies, and in fact, the latest one was this one, Echoes and Evidences of the Book of Mormon, which you've probably seen already. Uh, some of the material I'll be using today comes out of that book, which I did not write, though one of my articles is included therein. We have what's called the uh, uh, Joseph Smith Hits, or Gro Joseph Smith's Greatest Hits project going on at our organization. It's not a collection of, uh, of music on CD or cassette. <laughs> which is usually a dollar cheaper if you order on, off the television set, right? But uh, actually it's, uh, it's studies into things where Joseph Smith said something that seemed out of place at the time, but has since proven to be correct for, the, for ancient times. Uh, this book, Echoes and Evidences, in fact, is the first product coming out of that series. There'll be another one like this, each one with about 12 people contributing to it and listing what they consider to be some of the important hits. Um, there are two other volumes coming out of that, and I'm doing both of those. The first one, which will be finished and probably out later this year, is Joseph Smith and the Ancient World. And the other one is the Book of Mormon in the Ancient World. It won't be ready until next year. It's only about half done right now. But uh, we're going to take some things from that second one today. There will be some hopefully interesting things here and perhaps some things that you haven't heard before. Uh, to me, it's fascinating to see how much credence is being given to the Book of Mormon in um, not in the sense of um, everybody's believing its precepts and joining the church but at least in the, the belief that it's a serious subject for study. Over the last few years there have been several things done on this. Uh, there was just a, a conference um, last week I think it was at Yale University. Uh, there have been two at the uh, University of Nottingham. There's been one at Oxford University and uh, there was one other, I forget which, which other one. There are several that are doing uh, conferences now on Book of Mormon, and it's aimed mostly at uh, non-Mormons, people who are not believers. And so it's interesting to see that taking place. Uh, Terrell Givens, in fact, has had two of his books published by Oxford University Press. One is called uh, Viper on the Hearth. Viper on the Hearth was a book that uh, deals with um, uh, a history of anti-Mormonism, basically. Excuse me. Oh, by the way, is there anybody who can get me a glass of water in case I need one? Uh, 
while I'm up here. I get a little dried out these days from some medication I'm taking. Um, Gibbon's second book, it was called uh, By the Hand of Mormon, and it's, it was also published by Oxford. It's quite well done. He takes both sides of the picture, the LDS uh, side and the side of the critics, and shows how the, the disagreements have gone. Uh, he is LDS, of course, but he doesn't try to lean in one direction or another, but I think those who know the Book of Mormon sufficiently would be well impressed with his book and uh, see much of what he says as evidence for the Book of Mormon. Uh, last, not last year, but the year before last, uh, I was invited to give a paper on Hebrew names in the Book of Mormon at the World Congress of Jewish Studies held in Jerusalem. I, I think it's the first time that that organization of uh, scholars from all over the world, most of them Jewish, uh, had really uh, invited someone to discuss the Book of Mormon as one of the serious topics on that scholarly forum, and I was glad to do that. By the way, I've spoken to several others, symposia in Jerusalem, and one of the others was also on an LDS topic. It was on baptism for the dead, if you can believe that. <laughs> and one of me is big at this uh, symposium, uh, honoring a new exhibit opening at the, one of the museums in Jerusalem. And uh, so I, I, I said, well, the only thing I can really do right now is uh, baptism for the dead. They said, well, that sounds interesting. Let's do it. So I did. <laughs> uh, I'm all in favor of of that kind of thing. Let's look at some of the uh, things that I consider to be hits in the Book of Mormon. And we're only going to be able to scratch the surface of an ex a huge, huge topic here. Uh, Samuel, the Lamanite, as you know, prophesied that there would be a night without light, uh, without light at the, uh, or with light, rather, without darkness at the time of Christ's birth. There are several possibilities for how that took place. Uh, I'm not trying to say that there's no miraculous nature involved here, but the Lord uses natural means, of course, to accomplish things. There are, for example, glowing night fogs, which do occur. The cause is unknown. It's thought to that they might be electrical in nature. The ph phenomenon was first described in 1983 by a meteorologist, William R. Corliss. Uh, he discovered the that uh, there were a number of such instances that happened in the past. There was one where this luminous fog extended from Africa to Sweden and throughout North and South America. That's a gigantic fog, and it glowed in, in the dark. It, appear, uh, it appears also in a few other places, for example, in the Alps, as well as in the valleys uh, nearby. A similar fog fell in Western Europe in August of 1821. The first one was 1783, the one I mentioned to you. Uh, the 1831 fog was almost world, worldwide, and uh, Corliss concludes that nights were so bright that the smallest print could be read at midnight. In 1890, the engineer and passengers aboard a Houston, Texas Central Railroad train reported a glowing arch having the appearance of a mist in the moonla uh, moonless night. Low enough in the atmosphere, the train actually passed through beneath it and came onto the other side, and while they were beneath it, Everything was pale as if uh, under full moon, although there was no moon out on that particular night. A similar arch was reported uh, by another uh, train from the West Reading, Pennsylvania Railroad on 2nd May 1919. It was transparent, but bright enough to block out any of the stars that were behind it. Water break. There's also uh, what's called earthquake uh, related luminosity. For example, on the 9th of December, 1731, following an earthquake in Florence, Italy, uh, there were luminous clouds that appeared in, uh, over England. Several days prior to an earthquake that hit England on the 2nd of March, 1750, residents of London reported seeing these reddish bows in the air, which took the same direction as the shock when it finally did come. Uh, later that same year, on the 23rd of August, there was another aurora accompanied by a quake at Spalding, England. Still a month later, in September, at Northampton, there was another small earthquake, probably all related, by the way, one, you know, one after another here, and a Dr. Doddridge reported a fireball that morning, a red sky, the following night, and the night after that, quote, the finest aurora I've ever seen. Uh, similar things have happened in places like France, South America, in fact, it's very common in South America. They call it the Andes Glow. Uh, earthquakes are much more prone in that area than they are in Europe, and so 
uh, during times preceding and during earthquakes, there's actually a glow, and sometimes it follows the ridges for as much as 300 miles in length. In 1908, there, were, there was a particular time when there were some bright skies, very, very bright. Uh, that was the year in which a, an object uh, burned up in the atmosphere and exploded over the Tunguska region of Siberia, and you've probably, perhaps read some things about that. Various theories have been uh, put forward as to what it was. Uh, I, I think the least, the least acceptable is that it was an alien spaceship blowing up, and right after that is that it was a black hole that hit the Earth. I think that uh, it was a tiny black hole, see, and a big black hole that obliterated us entirely. But uh, I, I think it's more likely that the comet or asteroid theory is the truth, and that's what they've been looking at ever since 1937. Most surprising, however, uh, was that although the Europeans didn't know about this explosion in Siberia until after the word got back into Russia and then spread throughout other parts of Europe, still the nights uh, were very bright after this explosion. Uh, later people looking at this, uh, meteorologists have thought, well, this is probably reflected sunlight, but sometimes it lasted all night long. Uh, it covered most of northern Europe, parts of Asia, parts of North America, the sky growed with red and yellow hues, even when it was overcast. So the, it was bright enough to shine right through the clouds. Uh, it also affected some weather, by the way, in the northern hemisphere. In the British Isles, the, I'm just going to read part of this. In the British Isles, the northeast sky was tinted red, red, and people in Scotland reported that in rooms facing north, objects cast shadow at night. In London, it was possible to read the small print in the London Times at midnight. On 1st of July, 1908, Catherine Stephen of Godmanshire, Huntington, England, wrote to the Times of London that, quote, the strange light in the sky which was seen here last night by my sister and myself that appeared about midnight. She reported that the sky was for, was for some distance above the light, which appeared to be on the horizon as blue as in the daytime, with bands of bright, with a light cloud of pinkish color floating across it at intervals. Only the brightest stars could be seen in any part of the sky, though it was an almost cloudless night. It was possible to read the large print indoors at about 1.30 a.m. The room was quite light as if it had been day. Uh, photographs were taken by this natural light at 1 o'clock in the morning at Stockholm, Sweden, and also at Navrocek in Russia. Uh, and it looks like a bright summer afternoon if you look at the photos. I've seen, uh, I've seen both of those photos. Uh, one Russian uh, man reported that the brightness woke him up at 1.15 in the morning and he spent half an hour reading by light and said that by 1.45 the whole sky was a delicate salmon pink. There's actually a, um, a British painter, uh, see I have his name down here somewhere I think. Well, I, don't, I don't have it I guess, I didn't bring that part with me. There's a British painter who actually painted a, a series of pastels based on the glowing night sky the sky by which people would actually read. So you can see that uh, it's certainly possible, even from a purely naturalistic point of view, that there could be a night without darkness at the time of Christ's birth, as Samuel the Lamanite prophesied and as actually took place. On the other hand, Samuel prophesied that there would be darkness at the time of Christ's crucifixion. And there'd be three days of darkness. Uh, everything that is described in uh, the early chapters of 3rd uh, Nephi, particularly chapter 8, regarding the destruction, everything that's described there can be explained in terms of a volcanic explosion. Now most of us are used to seeing pictures of the volcanoes like uh, the ones in Hawaii where lava spouts out. That's not the kind of, of uh, volcano we're talking about though. This is an explosive volcano where the pressure builds up underneath and then the whole mountain just blows. Mount St. Helens was a, uh, one of those. But Mount St. Helens was very small compared to most other explosive volcanoes. Uh, still, at daytime, it was just pitch black, as you know, in Yakima, Washington, where people were gathering up the dust. You could still buy bottles of the dust from uh, Mount St. Helens. Mount Pinatubo in the uh, Philippines, also um, about, what, 15 years ago, something like that. Uh, some of the things that happen with these explosive volcanoes, first of all, there's a wind blast, obviously, that comes from it. The Mount St. Helens explosion, which as I said was not one of the really big ones, actually devastated something like uh, 200 million trees, just knocked them over flat. Um, things up to 40 miles away 
uh, were, were flattened by the shock wave that came from there. There were also the pyroclastic clouds, that is to say clouds of burning fire. Looks like fire mingled with smoke and they roll down the hillside at rapid speed, sometimes up to 200 miles an hour. And they'll just burn and destroy everything in their, in their sight. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, a, a wonderful, uh, well, maybe not wonderful, but a spectacular <laughs> explosion of a volcano uh, that uh, came in and wiped out a whole town. I'll uh, read you something about that in just a few moments. Uh, other things that are produced by these uh, volcanoes when they explode like this are uh, tornadoes, believe it or not, tornadoes and also firestorms. Now, if you don't know what a firestorm is, <laughs> I'll give you an example. There, there was an earthquake that occurred in Japan in which uh, a lot of the houses took fire because, you know, they, they, they cook on these open coal things at the, at the time. This is back in the early part of, the of this century, of the 21st century, 20th century, rather. And uh, all, the, all the coals, these hot coals were knocked off in all the houses, which are wooden frame houses, you know, with the paper walls between the door, between the rooms, etc and literally set them on fire. People gathered by the tens of thousands in a large park in Tokyo, and that was the worst place to go. There was no fire there as yet, but the, the firestorm just swept in from all sides. Tens of thousands of people died instantaneously. It can take place very quickly. Tornadoes, uh, some of you may not know, if you watch the weather often enough uh, when they're talking about the hurricanes, hurricanes do spawn tornadoes. So you sometimes have a hurricane, and then on the outs outskirts of the hurricane, you will have tornadoes. Tornadoes can carry people, houses, vehicles, anything, cows, away. If you've seen some of the movies where they do that nice special effects to see the cow floating in the air. Or uh, well, even the Wizard of Oz, they showed some things like that, right? These vol explosive volcanoes also send ash clouds into the stratosphere, which is what causes the darkening to take place. It can become pitch black in the daylight. And there have been several examples of, in historic times of this darkness lasting for three days, which is as long as it lasts in the Book of Mormon story. Um, lightning is something that also is mentioned in the Book of Mormon in connection with these great catastrophes. Lightning does occur in these uh, clouds that are formed both in the high stratosphere from the explosive uh, elements going up and also in the pyroclastic displays. There were some men, for example, who were on a, on a hillside, uh, something like 30 miles away from uh, Mount um, St. Helens when it exploded. And they saw the cloud heading right for them and lightning flashing all throughout the cloud. Uh, most of these do produce uh, lightning. Even the island uh, of Tsertse, which uh, some of you may remember, was formed spontaneously out of the Atlantic Ocean near Iceland in the 1960s. They also had lightning there in the clouds that were being shot up into the air. Um, earthquakes, of course, also come with, uh, with uh, the uh, destructive forces of these explosive volcanoes. And if they're near water sources, an ocean, for example, or uh, I guess even a large lake, but uh, not quite as much, you get tsunamis, the so-called tidal waves that uh, are shock waves sent through the water, and then go at a couple of hundred miles an hour and cross uh, vast expanses of, of uh, ocean, particularly in the Pacific, which is quite wide. Uh, Hilo, Hawaii gets hit by them from time to time when there are earthquakes uh, in the Americas. Just sends that um, water heading their way. Let me just look at a couple of here. Uh, by the way, did you know the biggest uh, earthquake in the United States did not take place in, um, in Yellowstone or in Alaska, where we've had really huge earthquakes back in the 60s. The biggest earthquake in U.S. history actually occurred back in 1811 in Missouri. Uh, I hope the next one occurs before any of us get asked to go back there. Uh, <laughs> Um, let me see. I'm not sure they used the Richter scale at that time. No, I don't have it here. But it does indicate that there was, it was accompanied by a storm that resembled a tornado. The sky was filled with black clouds and fierce lightning. This is from eyewitness uh, accounts. Swamps were drained and swampy areas became dry and large tracts of land rose or fell. For a time, parts of the Mississippi River actually flowed uphill. 
the, the, cent the center of this, uh, the epicenter was at uh, Madrid, uh, New Madrid in Missouri. There were two temporary waterfalls actually created on the Mississippi River during this time. Of the nearly 2,000 tremors that stuck the uh, struck the area during the next few months, the strongest flattened hundreds of square miles of forests, altered the course of the Mississippi, turned thousands of acres of prairie into swamp, submerged whole islands, produced massive landslides, and destroyed the town of New Madrid, lowering the ground beneath it some 15 feet in all. Final and most powerful earthquake uh, in that series occurred in 7th of February 1812 and was felt over an area of 1.5 million square miles, nearly half the continental United States. It caused church bells to ring in Charlotte, um, was that North Carolina, South Carolina? Um, so it was a really strong earthquake, let me tell you. That one was not associated with, uh, with any, um, uh, with any um, uh, volcano, however. One of the largest volcanic eruptions uh, in modern times was in 1815, the island of Tambora, which is a volcanic island in Indonesia, uh, literally blew at its top. The whole thing just, just blew. And shock waves were sent around the world. They were, sent, they were felt in various places. In fact, the water levels rose in Scotland by four inches during the time of uh, that explosion. Uh, it was actually heard uh, 1,600 miles away. I'm trying to think of the island name. Uh, it was um, Rodriguez, I believe, over in the Indian Ocean. Actually heard the explosion 1,600 miles away, if you could imagine that. Uh, this volcano poured ash into the stratosphere and moved mostly because of the wind currents over the northern hemisphere, even though the volcano itself is in the southern hemisphere. And it produced a, a, a year of winter all year round. There was frost or snow every day of the year, all through the summertime even. Uh, this ha for about three years they had bad winters. This was the time when the Smiths were living in Vermont and they had crop failures three years in a row. People in the eastern United States called it the, s the year without a summer because there was really no summer during that time. And this is why Joseph Smith and uh, his family moved to New York because they had lost so much during the three years uh, up, in, uh, up in Vermont. Uh, let's see, There's a couple of others here. I don't want to go into all of them. Oh, another one, another big one is 1883, the volcanic island of Krakatoa. Again, just blew uh, down there in Indonesia. Same place, the worst volcanoes are down there. Uh, there were, there were 10,000 people in one town, 50 miles away, who just simply vanished when this volcano exploded it sent a huge tsunami into, uh, into the land, went across the, uh, the uh, Sudra, as I think it's a Sudra State, Sudran State uh, Strait, and smashed into the town, washed all the buildings and people inland, uh, some of them quite some distance as a matter of fact. Uh, lots of other towns along the periphery of the islands in the vicinity uh, were also hit, some 30,000 people and all died in that. It's very, very much like what happened uh, in, um, in the Book of Mormon. Let me find you this one here. This is the last one I'll do. Just to show you that these things really happen. 192, during late April and early May, Mount Pele on the West Indian island of Martinique began rumbling and spewing hot ash. On the 2nd of May, the mountain shot up a dense black cloud with brilliant lightning. For several days, ash fell like snow on the nearby port city of St. Pierre. On the 5th of May, a mass of boiling mud rushed down to the sea, carrying 50-ton boulders. Two days later, La Souffrière, a volcano on the nearby island of St. Vincent, erupted and sent a steam cloud 30,000 feet into the air. Hot falling ash destroyed vegetation over a third of the island. A, um, a 50-foot mass of boiling mud formed in the Rab Rabaka Dry River and flowed downhill. On the 7th of May, the day of the eruption of Saint Vincent, a black cloud full of vivid lightning rose from Mount Pele. At 7.52 the next morning, the side of the volcano burst open and a huge wall of fire from superheated steam 
gases and ash rushed down the mountainside at 100 miles an hour, it's estimated. Actually, it was, it was actually filmed, by the way. There's an old film, one of those crank cameras. That, uh, somebody was on one of the boats uh, not too far away. And as it came down and engulfed the nearby port city of Saint-Pierre, instantaneously carbonizing many objects and killing all but two of the inhabitants. One of them was grateful that he was locked in the dungeon of the local Husgau. Uh, it saved his life because he was underground. There's also a dog that survived, by the way. Everybody else in town was completely wiped out. Uh, what another thing that happened, by the way, with this, because this, hu this huge, very hot mass of gases came down, uh, when, it, when it hit town, it burned up all the oxygen. And so there were, even if somebody had survived the burning, it would be difficult to survive not having oxygen to breathe. As soon as the cloud passed over the city, suddenly air rushed in to fill in the vacuum created by the oxygen uh, and created these fierce winds that knocked over some of the structures in the town itself. Well, there's lots more of that, but uh, I'll not go into that. Let's look at a few things regarding uh, Hebrew as far as the Book of Mormon is concerned. The, the it, uh, Nephites obviously spoke Hebrew. Um, Moroni says so in chapter 9 of Mormon and of course they came out of Jerusalem. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is that words, some words in the Book of Mormon reflect a Hebrew background rather than an English background. Uh, this is due mostly to word plays and to range of meaning of the words. Let me give you an example here. Uh, in English, we have a word snow. We know what snow is. It can fall from the sky. It can become, it can be just one flake. It can be a cluster of flakes. That's when we get these big ones falling. It can turn out to be rather hard snow. But it's still snow, right? When it's on the ground, it's still snow. But the Eskimos, who have a lot more snow than we do, have a whole bunch of different words. Eight of them, for sure, and some, uh, some linguists have uh, suggested that others also have the same kind of meaning. And they have words for falling snow, they have words for drifting snow, they have words for snow that's settling on the ground, and so on. And then, of course, snow that's frozen with a frozen crust on top of it. So they have different words for snow uh, because of their environment. On the other hand, Arabic uh, has only one word, that co it's thalj, which covers snow, frost, hail. <laughs> it, it covers anything that's uh, frozen, a wider range of meaning than any of the than the English in, uh, in, it, it is known by the Eskimos and a smaller range than the English is known to the Arabs. Let me give you some examples here. In Alma 49.4, the Lamanites attempted to, quote, cast their stones and their arrows at the Nephites atop the city, uh, wall of the city of Ammonaha. We find the same uh, thing in Alma 49.22. Well, I can imagine throwing stones. Anybody thrown an arrow lately? Uh, may seem strange to say they're throwing stones and arrows. Uh, John Sorensen has suggested that maybe they were using the atlatl, which is a, a spear thrower, or I guess you could use something that could be called an arrow. And it, it gives you a length, a little bit more length to your arms so that when you come around, whatever is at the end is going faster and your spear would go out at quite a bit more speed and you'd have more distance and more power behind it. Be able to knock down some bigger game by doing that. However, we don't even have to go that far, although that's a possibility. But even if they use bows, that's fine, because in Hebrew, the word to throw is the same word used meaning to shoot an arrow. And so uh, here's, a, here's some that, uh, where the word range of the word meaning and the word fits Hebrew better than it does English. In 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 6, Lehi prays to the Lord, comes a fill says, there came a pillar of fire and dwelt upon a rock before him. I usually think of dwelling as meaning you purchased a home and moved in. Uh, fire obviously wasn't dwelling in that sense, was it? The Hebrew word yeshav means both to dwell and to sit. Uh, they're not separate words in Hebrew like they are in English. Hedman chapter 9, verse 6, a Nephite judge is stabbed by his brother by a garb of, mer of secrecy. We have the critics getting on us all this time about this one. Garb, that means garment, means a piece of clothing. How do you stab somebody with a piece of clothing? Well, you don't, obviously. Clothing doesn't work very well. 
However, it, it actually corresponds rather well to an English term. We talk about a, uh, a garb of secrecy, don't we? A, a cloak of secrecy and a few other similar uh, terms. However, the Hebrew word beged probably fits the case much better here because beged can mean not only garment, it also means treachery. And here, uh, the uh, man is being killed the judge, an Ephi judge, is being killed by treachery. And let's see, I'll, I'm not going to go over all these. I'll just skip over a few of them. Well, one that struck me uh, is the Hebrew word makom, which literally means place of arising. It comes from a verb meaning to arise, to stand up, to get on one's feet. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting that in some Bible passages, biblical scholars have suggested it should be referred to as a grave or tomb. Um, Job chapter 16 verse 18, Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 11, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 20, and Ecclesiastes chapter 6 verse 6 for those who are keeping copious notes. Uh, so it, it, sometimes it's used for a place where the dead are go in the sense of their spirit. Uh, in Phoenician, which is related to Hebrew, written in the same ancient alphabet by the way, and uh, spoken in ancient Lebanon and uh, Canaan. In Phoenician, the, the term is actually used only for a grave site. There are a number of tombs of Phoenician kings where it talks about do not disturb this makom, and makom there meaning the tomb. Uh, what interests me here in this one is that in the Book of Mormon I found 11 places where the word place, which is the usual translation of makom in the Bible, the word place is used in reference to either where someone died or where he was buried or where his spirit went after he died. So it's used in, those, in that range of meanings and uh, in Joseph Smith's day nobody had ever suggested that those were meanings applicable to the, to the Hebrew word. Uh, that all of that came about long after his time. I in fact uh, did a paper on this uh, some years back when I was uh, taking uh, a course in uh, Hebrew etymology from Professor Chaim Rabin, who was chairman of the Hebrew Language Academy. And uh, he, he really loved it whenever I threw in the Book of Mormon references. <laughs> um, I have to tell you about Rabin because Rabin uh, used to give a lecture every year to all the American students who would come to study at the Hebrew University. There were about 7,000 American students there at any given time. So you'd get, you know, maybe 2,000 of them showing up uh, 2,000 new ones every year. And his lecture was always on the um, history of, uh, of the Hebrew language. Uh, back in the early 70s, I think it was 1970, I got a letter from uh, Bob Smith, who was attending that lecture that year in Jerusalem. And uh, he told me about it, that, uh, that Rabin was quoting a passage, a scriptural passage to them, to illustrate the use of the conjunction and in Hebrew. But because these were new students from America, most of them didn't know Hebrew. So he was giving the lecture in English, and that's why he was quoting in English. Uh, he wanted to illustrate that they used the word and in Hebrew in a lot more places than we would use it in English. Now, some of you who've read the Book of Mormon a lot will know that it's and this, and this, and this, and this, and it just keeps going on. It's very, very common. That is a feature of the Hebrew language. Well, the interesting thing is that as Rabin was reading this, my friend Bob Smith thought, wait a second, he's not quoting from the Bible, that's a Book of Mormon passage. <laughs> and, uh, and it turns out that uh, when, he, when Rabin finished quoting that passage, he says, well, I know some of you have studied the Bible and you know you've never seen this passage there and I just have to tell you that it, it's not from the Bible, it's from the Book of Mormon, which is a much better example of this kind of thing. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> I had lots of fun. Take, I took about half a dozen classes from Rabin during the uh, eight and a half years I was living in Israel. And um, I, often, I often drew on uh, the fact that I knew he liked the Book of Mormon and believed it was an authentic ancient Hebrew text. So I would throw in some things too. Uh, and he always gave me good grades, so he did in fact like it. <laughs> Here's one that uh, is a wordplay type. Alma chapter 32, verse 21. Alma tells the Zoramites, If ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. The Hebrew words for faith and truth come from the same root. 
And so this makes a lot more sense in Hebrew than it does in English. You hope for, if you have faith, yeah, if you have faith, you hope for things which are not seen, which are true. So you can't have faith in untrue things. You may hope for them, you may believe them, but faith in the scriptural sense is not what we have in things that are untrue. One of the things that's fascinated me over the years, and it first came to my attention about 1969 or 70, is uh, the use of Egyptian characters to write Hebrew and related texts. Now Hebrew is part of um, the, the language family called Northwest Semitic. Uh, actually Hebrew, Canaanite, Phoenician, um, even Punic, which is the dialect of Phoenician, um, and Moabite and Edomite and um, Ammonite are all basically the same language. There may be dialectal differences, you know, like somebody, like somebody from down south uh, has a different accent than you do, or they might use some words different than the ones you used. Last night there was a discussion at the table when we were eating, what's this yellow stuff here? And we, we concluded that maybe it was grits, though it wasn't exactly like southern grits. <laughs> I think that's what it was, by the way, but um, anyways. Uh, the, I, I know that you all talked about it too, but from the, <laughs> your reaction here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what was my point? I forgot my point. <laughs> Got to, you, you guys laugh too loud, and then you make me forget where I was. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, uh, the point I want to make is that Canaanite language, the Canaanite languages are actually the same as Hebrew. They're written in the same alphabets. And there may be a slight dialectal difference, but Canaanites and, and Israelites could talk to each other uh, because they used the same language, actually. Now, in Moron Mormon chapter 9, verses 32 to 34, we have this statement by Moroni about using Reformed Egyptian, but he says that they also knew Hebrew. And in 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 2, Nephi said, I make a record in the language of my father, which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. Uh, this always made me think that actually what we have here is probably a combination of things. We would, might have Hebrew uh, written in Egyptian characters, or that we might have a mixture of the two. Well, as it turns out, all of these are possibilities. Egyptian actually had four different writing systems. The first one you've all seen, it's called hieroglyphic, which means sacred writing. And it's those drawings, you know, of birds and humans and various body parts and furniture and so on. This is hieroglyphic. It's the one that they used mostly for engraving on stone, although you'll find it written on parchment and, and well, mostly papyrus also. Uh, there's an, a cursive form of this. It's called hieratic, which means sacred. Hieratic is, uh, is li a lot like the... Uh, the hieroglyphic, but it's a little bit faster way of writing things, and so some things might be obscured to us in our day if we don't study both systems of writing. An even more uh, common or, or um, uh, abbreviated form of writing Egyptian was called demotic. It came into use about 800 BC and was already being used for about 200 years before Lehi's time. By the way, all of the ancient texts out of uh, Israel whether Jewish or um, Israelite in the north, all of them use Egyptian characters for numerals. Everything's written in, Egyptian, in, in Hebrew alphabet, which has 22 letters, but when they write the numbers, they actually use the Egyptian characters, and that is known from, from as early as the 9th century BC, the use of, Egy of these Egyptian numer numerals in, uh, in Hebrew writing. But what's more surprising is that there are, in fact, some texts that have been found that are Hebrew or a related language that are written, in fact, in Egyptian characters, not in Hebrew characters. It's, let me illustrate this way. I could write a Hebrew word in English so that you would recognize it, but it's not the way they'd write it in Israel, right? The word shalom. If I were to write this in Hebrew, I'd write shin, lam, vav, mem. But if we were, supposed, we were going to write it in English, we would write S-H-A-L-O-M. Those letters don't belong to the Hebrew language, but we can still use them to uh, represent Hebrew words. Same thing here with Egyptian characters representing Hebrew words. Uh, there's, for example, the London Magical Papyrus of the 14th century BC, 
found in Egypt and uh, the Harris Magical Papyrus of the next century, 13th century BC, Papyrus Anastasi I, also 13th century BC, an ostracon in the uh, Cairo Museum, number uh, 25759, uh, from the 11th century BC. All of these have Hebrew-like text written in Egyptian characters. If you know only Egyptian, you can't, you can pronounce them, but you don't know what it's saying because it's not Egyptian words. If you know Hebrew, <laughs> you can't read it because the characters are not Hebrew characters. So you have to know both languages in order to read the thing. You have to know the writing system as well as the language in which it's written. That explains why King Benjamin had to teach uh, Egyptian to his sons, as mentioned in the beginning of uh, uh, Moroni chapter 1, because they had to understand how that written system worked. If they were going to deal with the records that had been started by Nephi, uh, in imitation, of course, of the brass plates, which were told in Mosiah, were also written in this uh, Egyptian form. Um, what these things demonstrate is that there were some Egyptian scribes who were sufficiently skilled in Northwestern Semitic languages, Hebrew or Canaanite, that they were able to transliterate it using their own writing system. However, we now have similar writings from Israel itself. Uh, again, Hebrew, Hebrew writings that are used that use the Egyptian characters. The first one uh, comes from a place called Arad, which is about, oh, 24 miles south-southeast of Jerusalem. Uh, several Hebrew ostracra were found there, dating between 598 and 587 BC in 1965. These are all letters that were written. Uh, however, they found one that same year, an Egyptian hieratic ostracon. Ostracra are pieces of pottery, by the way, when they we don't uh, do this anymore. We use, you know, I take these home and I turn it upside down. My wife puts it in her pile of scratch paper and she writes her notes on the back of it, right? Uh, in ancient times, when they break a piece of pottery, they'd collect up the large pieces and uh, they would use those for their scratch paper. So we have this ostracon that has Egyptian hieratic in it. It's purely Egyptian characters and Egyptian uh, words as well. However, in 1967, two years after that one was discovered, they found one that has a combination of Hebrew and Egyptian. It's a single text. It's not one text and then a translation of the same text into another language. It's, it's written in both uh, characters, both sets of characters, but they're intermingled. There are 17 words on it. Of the 17 words, seven are written with Hebrew letters and ten are written with Egyptian characters. But the text reads the same, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all Egyptian. Even the words written with Hebrew characters are Egyptian words, not Hebrew words. 1970s, excavations in northern Sinai at Tel Kodera, which is the biblical uh, Kadesh Barnea where the Israelites had their main camp during the Exodus. Several ostraca of the 6th and 7th centuries BC were found. Some of them are scribal exercises only. One, for example, is a hieratic text that has a column of Egyptian measures and five columns of numbers. But mingled in with it are some Hebrew characters. The Hebrew word for 1,000, or as, as alafim, which is actually thousands, plural, is found on it three times. There are 10 instances of the number uh, 10,000. The Hebrew symbol for shekel is also used there 22 times. There's one ostracon with three columns of numbers. The left-hand column has Hebrew word gara, which is a weight measure. It's the smallest of the weight measures in Hebrew. And it immediately follows a hieratic or Egyptian numeral. Uh, the interesting thing is all these were in use in the time of Lehi. Uh, let's see. I heard some clapping next door, but my watch still says we have uh, almost five minutes, not quite. Let me just do a few things here. Now, I told you we'd be scratching the surface. We're never going to get very far in this unless we meet all year. Some of the earliest criticisms of the Book of Mormon leveled against it in 1832 and 1834. Metal plates. Nobody in antiquity ever wrote on metal plates. That was one of the criticisms. Reformed Egyptian. There's no such thing as Reformed Egyptian. The third... Nobody ever hid away 
sacred records so that future generations could find them. These were three major criticisms leveled against the Book of Mormon when it first was published. However, they've all turned out to be true. In fact, the oldest biblical texts fit this pattern. Let me illustrate. The oldest, the very oldest of anything written in Hebrew is, uh, was discovered in 1980 in a, in a tomb beside the Scottish uh, Presbyterian Church of St. Andrews in Jerusalem. I don't know if any of you visited that church. That's where the heart of Robert Bruce, King of Scotland, is buried. When he died, uh, he, they buried him, in, uh, of course, in Scotland, but he wanted his heart to be buried in Jerusalem because he didn't get over there on pilgrimage as he had hoped to do. Um, he's in a, it's in an ivory box, by the way, if you're interested in those gory details. So I uh, discovered this, this tomb. The tomb itself is from the end of the 7th century BC. In other words, 600 BC, roughly. That's the end of the 7th century, right? And the beginning of the 6th century. There were two rolled up pieces of silver with writing on them. In, and each one had the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. So the oldest known biblical, the oldest known documents containing a biblical passage are written on metal plates. The second oldest of the Hebrew texts is actually, uh, the uh, Jewish text I should say, because in this case it's Aramaic, is um, Amherst Papyrus 63, which was found in Egypt. It's written in Egyptian demotic characters, but it doesn't say anything in Egyptian. It's Aramaic, which is a sister language to Hebrew. Aramaic is the language that was beginning to be very popular back in the 8th century BC among most peoples in the ancient Near East, including the most educated among the Jews. By the 5th century BC, all of the Jews spoke Aramaic and did not speak Hebrew anymore. And it just simply replaced Hebrew, but they kept the same alphabet. They, it, they were both, they're so closely related, these two languages. If you learn Hebrew and you start reading some Aramaic texts, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of it because they're that close. This papyrus is from the 4th century BC. It includes a quote of Psalm 20, verses 2 through 6. So the second oldest biblical, uh, second oldest document with biblical text on it is actually uh, written in Reformed Egyptian because Demotic is a, form of re is a Reformed uh, cursive script. The third oldest biblical uh, text, the third oldest document with biblical text on it would be the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in 1947-48 mostly, although some were recovered as late as 1952-56, there were some as well. These were hidden in jars and caves preserved for future generations to discover, probably by people who were fleeing the area. One of these scrolls uh, contains a book of Exodus, it's uh, 4Q17, again for those of you taking notes. It was written in the middle of the third century BC, so it's the, one of the very earliest copies of a biblical text, and it is one that was hidden away to be discovered by future generations. So in fact, uh, all the things that were leveled against the Book of Mormon, at least those major ones I just mentioned now, have proven to be true insofar as the oldest Bible texts are concerned. That tells me the Book of Mormon's in pretty good company. Well, they're opening the doors. That means uh, people are going to flood in here to eat. So <laughs> I will um, end at this point, and thank you so much for your time. Anybody made a critique?